Well, good morning. Got a number of things here. This is an onion, in case you're wondering. You'll figure out what that's for later. So, uh, welcome. Glad that you're here today. Uh, when you came in this morning, you probably saw these uh, Crossbridge Groups catalogs on your seats. Um, if you're new to Crossbridge, we launch groups three times a year, and we produce these catalogs to show you what the open groups are that you can join. And in this catalog, there's a number of uh, different groups meeting all over the place, Ottawa, LP area, Mendota, and uh, different kinds of groups, different lengths of time. And so we invite you to actually take that with you when you leave today and check that out this week and uh, then sign up start on Saturday. And so we believe that when you join a group, it's the best place for growth to happen, both uh, in your relationships with others and your relationship with God. And so uh, I'm the groups guy at Crossbridge. And so I promise the plug is over. Okay. So, but take that with you and check that out this week. We start signups next Saturday. Well, we do, uh, we are continuing our series, Address the Mess, <clears throat> and we're looking at forgiveness and different dimensions of forgiveness. And the, the type of forgiveness we're looking at today is difficult. Uh, you might even say the struggle is real. How many of you have heard that phrase, right? The, the young kids seem to use that phrase, the struggle is real, when they talk about things that are difficult. And I thought I'd warm us up a little bit today and talk about different ways the struggle is real, okay? So we'll have some pictures to, to get us going, all right? So uh, when you are a Bears fan, the struggle is real, all right? Uh, when a drive across town should take seven and a half minutes but takes 30 minutes because of a train, the struggle's real. And, and I'd also add to this, when your wife wants to single-handedly take on the railroad industry, the struggle's real, all right? Well, when you live in Illinois but you dream of Florida beaches, the struggle is real. Uh, when you get rid of all, and I mean all, of the baby stuff you own because you're done having kids and you find out you're having a third child, the struggle is real. <laughs> Just saying, okay? When your lead pastor won't stop talking about the St. Louis Cardinals, the struggle <laughs> is real. Yes. So I can say that because he's not here today, all right? So we're going to like edit that part of the video, right? Is it possible? Okay, anyways. So, well, today uh, we're talking about forgiveness and a, a subject within forgiveness where the struggle really is difficult. And today we're talking about though forgiving those who have sinned against us. And, and I think one of the reasons why today is so difficult is because it's really personal. Uh, for some of you, all I had to say was that phrase, right? Uh, forgiving those who sinned against us. And someone's name or face popped into your head. Someone who has sinned against you. Uh, see, I think part of what makes today maybe a little bit difficult as we think about the subject is we're not talking broadly about forgiving others. We're talking about forgiving people who have sinned against us specifically. Uh, these people that hurt us, they have names. They have faces. There's memories. And for some of us, pain is probably still very real from the way that they hurt us. And you see, today's message is deeply personal because our pain is personal uh, because the people that hurt us hurt us in a very real way. And so when we think about forgiving those who have sinned against us, the struggle is real. And so today I want to talk about that. I want to talk about the struggle of forgiving those who have sinned against us. But I also want to think about how Jesus helps us and challenges us to become forgiving people. And so we're going to get in in Matthew 18 in just a few moments. But before, I want to give you just a little background on what's going on uh, with Jesus and his disciples. And many of you know Jesus picked 12 people to invest his life in. And these disciples, they walked together over a period of time. There were other followers and other disciples of Jesus, but these 12 were the ones that he invested in specifically over a three-year period. You might even call them his uh, small group, you know, just saying. Anyways, so Jesus is in the middle of investing in these men, and he's about halfway through, and they're in a very intense period of teaching, of training, and Jesus teaches by telling stories, uh, by showing through experiences, and by teaching them from Scripture. And so today we get into this in Matthew 18, Jesus teaching them about forgiveness. And it begins with one of the disciples, Peter, asking Jesus a really simple question. This is Matthew 18, verse 21. 
It says, then Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? No, not seven times, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. Therefore, the, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with the servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process, one of his debtors was brought in who owed him millions of dollars. He couldn't pay, so his master ordered that he be sold, along with his wife, his children, and everything he owned to pay the debt. But the man fell down before his master and begged him, please be patient with me, and I will pay it all. Then his master was filled with pity for him, and he released him and forgave his debt. But when the man, that same man, left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. He grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. His fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little more time. Be patient with me and I will pay it, he pleaded. But his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put in prison until the debt could be paid in full. When some of the other servants saw this, they were very upset. They went to the king and told him everything that happened. Then the king called in the man he had forgiven and said, You evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he had paid his entire debt. That's what my heavenly father will do if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. Let's pray together today. Uh, Father, we come before you today reading challenging words and trying to understand, to think about what this could look like in our lives. And, and Father, just very really, we need your help. We need your help to, to help us understand what forgiveness looks like in each one of our lives. God, we need your help to, to soften maybe parts of our heart that are very hard from pain and hurt from the past. God, we need you to speak and to help us today. And so we invite you to come for your spirit to speak to us in the, the depths of our spirit today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, in, in the verse we just read, Peter asks a pretty simple question. He, he asked Jesus, how many times do I need to forgive someone who sins against me? And Jesus answers, and then he launches into the story. And, and the story compares these two servants. You probably caught that the first servant owed millions of dollars. Uh, the king wants his money back, but the servant can't pay up. And so the king says that the man and his family and everything he owns should be sold to pay for the debt. The man's distraught, obviously, and so the story tells us the man fell down before his master, begged him, please be patient with me, I will pay it all. The master was filled with pity for him, released him, and forgave his debt. Now, if you're the disciples, you hear that, and you step back and think, wow, now wait a second, millions of dollars? Who forgives millions of dollars of debt? And so they're thinking, what, what kind of story is this? What is Jesus telling us about forgiveness? This is, this is over the top. This is amazing mercy and forgiveness. But Jesus doesn't stop the story there. He continues. And he says, when this man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him just a few thousand dollars. He grabbed him by the throat, demanded instant payment. His fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little more time, be patient with me and I will pay it. But his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put in prison until the debt could be paid in full. You imagine, again, if you're the disciples, you are probably pretty angry as you hear the second part of the story. Even us today, our hearts are filled a little bit with anger, and we think, how could that be? How could someone that was forgiven such a tremendous amount of debt would be unforgiving to someone who owes him just a little what is going on here? This man was forgiven. How could that happen? The contrast between these two people is huge. But Jesus presents the story that way uh, for a reason, on purpose. He's making a point about human nature. You see, Jesus knows that our natural tendency is to want forgiveness 
but to withhold it from those who have sinned against us. When everything's on the line for you and me, we really want to be forgiven. We may even plead and beg to be forgiven when we have done something wrong. But when someone else hurts us, we struggle to forgive. We maybe even withhold and think, I don't know if you deserve my forgiveness, but, but I, I should be forgiven. Uh, in college, I served on a, a ministry team at a local church, and there was about seven of us on this ministry team. There was two staff members from the church on there and, and five other uh, volunteer members um, that were on this ministry team. We'd meet one, once a month to plan some things for the church. And in the course of one of the meetings where we were, we were uh, the meeting was going along, and we are having some discussion about uh, some plans for the church. And one of the members in the team uh, said something that was just honestly very, very blunt and harsh and even biting about one of my family members. And it was a very awkward moment in that meeting. Everybody kind of fell silent. Their faces turned a little bit red. And everyone directed their attention at the man like, did you just say that here in this moment? And, and the man responded with, well, it's true, isn't it? And you could hear a pin drop in the meeting. And of course, everybody knew that I was gritting my teeth in anger, uh, being there a college student on this ministry team and really uh, struggling with what was just said. And, and the meeting moved on awkwardly. Someone changed the subject and we went on. But as I walked out of the church building that night, I was boiling with anger. Maybe you've been there too. When you've been hurt, someone's caused you pain and you walk out of that situation angry. The, the last thing I wanted to do in that moment was to forgive the person who had hurt me. And so over that week, I was really struggling, man. I wanted to fight. I wanted to protect. I wanted to get back. And so that week progressed, and, and that person who had said those things uh, came to me and said, I, I was in the wrong. I'm really sorry for what I did, and I ask for your forgiveness. Now, I was a Christian, he was a Christian, we were leaders on this team together, but the, the very last thing I wanted to do was to forgive that person. See, maybe, maybe you've been there, right? When someone's hurt you, when someone's sinned against you, maybe it was you, maybe it was a family member, and you have been hurt. Our natural reaction is to fight, to protect the last thing we want to do in those times is to forgive the person that's hurt us. We have a hard time forgiving those who sin against us because of the pain that they cause in our lives. Our natural reaction is to, is to protect ourselves. How, and we ask, how dare they do that? How dare they do that to me? How dare they do that to someone I love? And for some of us, that pain may have happened a month ago or a year ago maybe five years ago, maybe 10 years ago. But the pain is still fresh. It's still real. It's still there. You and I both know certain people who are held captive because they haven't forgiven those who hurt them. Uh, some conflict or something happened and they just can't forgive. They can't move on from the pain that's in their lives. You and I both know people, or maybe we are those people today who are held captive because we haven't forgiven those who caused us pain. And so we struggle. <laughs> the struggle is real to forgive those who hurt us. Now, this is the part of the message where I'd like to just say, it's all good, right? Jesus is cool with that. He gets pain. He encountered pain himself. People hurt him deeply, and so he understands. Don't worry about it. Just go about your life. That's what I want to say to you today. But it's not what Jesus tells us. And so Jesus is pretty clear about forgiveness. And in Matthew 6, just it's blunt and it's in our face. And Jesus simply says, if you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. This is tough, right? So this is where I'd, I'd like to try to pull out the John Amplified version, and I start taking my pen out and I rewrite, right? And, and Jesus says, hey, it's, it's cool, I know your pain, and so like, if you want to forgive them, that's cool or not, either way, no problem, love you, see you later, right? But it's just not what Jesus says. If we're going to be Christians, we have to be true to what Jesus commands us. And so Jesus says, if you're going to receive forgiveness from the Father, you have to for 
forgive those who have sinned against you. Now, there's two really, really big questions, I think, right here that I almost like just need to step outside uh, of this message and just address. And so for the, the first question, I think, really is this. Does forgiveness mean that the relationship is healed? Not necessarily. That's reconciliation. And, and for a relationship to be healed, the person who has sinned has to be repentant, right? Right? And so forgiveness doesn't actually mean reconciliation. Now, a deep level of forgiveness is reconciliation, but you may forgive a person who is never repentant. That relationship may never be healed because they may never admit to doing wrong. So in that instance, when you forgive, it's for your own healing. You are making the choice to forgive, but you're finding healing in yourself. The relationship itself may not be made right The Bible talks about pursuing that as much as we are able, as much as it depends on us. And so there are times where someone is not repentant. We forgive them. The relationship may remain broken, but we've done our part. And now what about justice, right? This is a big question. Like, should we pursue justice depending on what this hurt has been with this pain? Well, just because we forgive someone doesn't remove the consequences of their sin. Okay, so, so think about God. God forgives us of our sin, but he allows us to experience the consequences of our sin. And so I want to say very clearly today that God is not soft on evil. God is a God of justice. God is not calling any of you to remain in some abusive relationship. That's not forgiveness. That's not what we're talking about here today. There's consequences to our actions both on earth and in heaven. Those are two really important points. Well, well, back back to Jesus. The big idea behind Jesus' words earlier is that Christians are forgiving people. The forgiveness we have received is a gift. We've done nothing to earn it. And so that gift increases as we pass it along to others. Paul says it this way. Make allowance for each other's faults. Forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, The Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. It's this idea that God has been merciful to us, and so we need to extend that same mercy to others. And this is important because forgiveness is an expression of love. Christianity is founded on love. The greatest commandment is loving God with all you've got. And the second greatest is loving your neighbor as yourself. So if we're going to call ourselves Christian, we have to be forgiving people. Forgiveness is at the very heart of what it means to be a Jesus follower. Uh, A year ago, I was in my office on a a morning, and someone popped their head in, and uh, they said, do you have a minute? That's always a dangerous question to answer, because no one really means do you have 60 seconds. But I did have a minute, and I had more than a minute, and I said, I do have a minute. Come on in. And so we sat down, and the person said, you know, I don't know if you know my story, Pastor John. And the person stopped and said, actually, you know, I, you don't, I know you don't know my story because there's only five people on this earth that know my story. And so the person sat down and began to share their story, their story, a very raw story of pain and hurt at the hands of someone else. And someone else had sinned against them and made a mess in their life. And so as this person sat across pouring their heart out to me, sharing their story, on a random weekday morning, I sat there and I listened. And at the end of the story, the person said, you know, I'm not exactly sure why I wanted to share that with you, but I felt this morning when I woke up that I needed to come and share this with you today. And she said, I I think I'm really struggling with forgiveness. And I don't know what forgiveness looks like in this situation for me here. And so we prayed about it and we wrestled with it and we asked God to help her understand what forgiveness would look like. And, and we went on. But I, I remember that day wrestling with this concept. What, what does forgiveness look like? Uh, for personal hurt, it's probably different for each one of us, but, but what does that look like, the process of it? And, and I continued to wrestle with it. But I think our passage gets at it just a little bit today. Uh, Peter, when he asked Jesus, he says, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me seven times? Jesus responds and says, no, not seven times, but 70 times seven. 
Now, Jesus' point isn't that we forget 490 times, right? That, that we're making uh, uh, an Excel spreadsheet and we're counting every time we forgive the person. And once we get to 490, we're good. Uh, Jesus isn't saying that. I think what Jesus is saying is that forgiveness is a process. And I think it's kind of like an onion. Ha <laughs> ha, the onion came into play, all right? So I think what Jesus is saying is that forgiveness is like an onion. And I'd say this onion maybe represents the pain, right? Maybe it's the mess that someone else has caused in our life, the sin that they have sinned against us and the mess that it's made. And so when we make the choice to address this mess, to, to begin the process of forgiving the person who sinned against us, we peel back a little bit of that onion. And so as we peel this onion, we're making the choice to forgive those who have sinned against us. And it's kind of funny because I think like for most of us, that first step of forgiveness is really just resisting the urge to get revenge, right? To get them back, to hurt them back. And so we're peeling back that onion and we say, okay, God, I forgive them. I give up my right, my desire, whatever we want to say, to hurt them back. And so I forgive them. And now the thought is, did, did we forgive the person? We peeled back a layer of the pain of the onion. Yeah, absolutely. We made the choice to forgive the person that hurt us, to address the pain that they caused in our lives. But on down the road, you, you know this, and those of you that have, may have significant or deep wounds know this especially, the pain comes back. Maybe a, maybe a memory or maybe something happens, and, and we think, well, I thought I forgave that person already. And sometimes we can even beat ourselves up and think, wait, is something wrong with me? Like, am I, am I not a good enough Christian? Is my relationship with God not, not in the right? Like, I, I thought I already addressed this. But the truth is, forgiveness is a process. And so we make the choice again to peel back another layer of the pain. And so we forgive the person again. Now, did we forgive the person the first time? Yeah, we absolutely forgave them the first time as much as we were able in that moment to forgive them. And we forgive them right now as we peel back another layer of the onion as much as we are able in this moment. And so we peel back another layer. And the reality is the pain's still there. It's less. The mess is still there. It's less. Have we forgiven the person? Yes. Is there going to be more forgiving to do? Absolutely. And so I think forgiveness is like an onion because we continue to address the mess in our lives. We continue to address the pain. We revisit it over time. I think Jesus is saying, Peter, if you're counting forgiveness, you're totally missing the point. You're missing the point. You're missing the heart of forgiveness because it can't be measured. Forgiveness is something that you will revisit over time. And I think Jesus is even saying, Peter, you might have to come back to this bad boy 490 times before you find healing. And that's okay. And, and, and Jesus might even be saying, you know what? This, this mess, this hurt, this pain might be with you for the rest of your life. But you continue to forgive. You continue to address. And you continue the process. I think it's not only that we revisit it over time. But I think there's depths of layer and dimension to forgiveness. You see, the Bible isn't super specific about what it means to forgive a person. It gives a really broad and wide definition of forgiveness. Some of the definitions of forgiveness in the Bible are resisting revenge, not repaying evil for evil, even coming to a point where we could wish the other person well. We can maybe even come to a point where we've forgiven them so much that we grieve when the person who hurt us is hurt by someone else. The Bible is pretty bold in saying you can come to a point where you've forgiven them so that when you pray for them, you're praying that God would even bless them. Now, forgiveness can get as deep as the relationship being made right and reconciliation as far as it depends on us. And then forgiveness can even reach a point where the person who hurt us is, is in need. They need help. And we'd be the one to reach out and to help them. You see, I think forgiveness is unlike an onion because we don't only revisit it, but as we peel back the layers, we experience a deeper and deeper level of forgiveness. And it works its way deeper and deeper into our hearts. 
And so we revisit the pain. We make the choice to forgive again. We resist revenge all the way to being willing to help them when they find themselves in need. But how do we become that kind of person, right? We're not naturally those people. How do we become the kind of people that are willing to not only peel one layer, but to peel 490 layers? Well, I think there's two really quick things I want to share this morning. The first is we have to believe a certain thing, and that is simply this, that God is working all things together for the good of those who love him. Romans 8, 28 says it this way, we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God that are called according to his purpose for them. You see, I really believe that God is dynamically working in this world, interacting and responding to the pain and the hurt, working in the lives of those who love him. He takes everything and can make it good. It's really important to say that God doesn't cause everything, but he can cause all the things in our life to be good. He can work it for good. Now, we may not see it in the moment, right? We may may not have perspective, and we even wonder, is it possible that this mess could become good? I, I don't see it. I don't understand it. But we can trust that God is able to take that mess and bring some good out of it, which is really good news for us because it means that we don't have to redeem our own pain. We don't have to try to fix the things in our life because God is the only one that can redeem our pain. He's the only one that can take our hurt and make it good. That's not our job. That's his job. So the first way we become forgiving persons is trusting that God can take that mess and in some way bring good out of it. Now the second way that we become a forgiving person is by doing something. And that's simply praying for those who have hurt us. Jesus says in Matthew 5, you've heard the law, says love your neighbor and hate your enemy. I say love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. And that way you will be acting as true children of your father in heaven. Now Jesus tells us pray for those who have hurt you. Pray for those who have caused your pain. As you do, you'll find that you're becoming a forgiving person. Is that easy? Absolutely not. No, it's not easy to pray for those who have hurt us, who have caused our pain. In fact, when we pray, those prayers are forced. We don't even really feel them. But maybe even the first prayer to God is, God, I can't even pray for that person. Help me because I'm unable. Help me to begin to pray for them. But Jesus begins, he gives us this thing to do to begin praying for those who persecute us. Because as we do, our hearts are changed towards them. We become a more forgiving person, extending that to them. We take on the character of Jesus himself. You see, we believe that God can turn our pain and make the mess that someone else has caused in our lives, that he can bring some good out of it. And he gives us this practice to do, to pray for them, to help us on the journey. Now today, I really want to honor and just say, this is difficult work. Like, this is hard. And I don't, I don't want to stay, stand up here today and say, I understand or even know your pain. That I don't. I don't know all of your stories. I don't know the depths of your pain or your hurt. And I'm not going to stand up here and say, go do it. You know, you got this. I'm not going to stand up here and act like I understand or to trivialize what you've been through. I guess what I want to stand up here today and say, it's really, really hard. But it's possible. And it's kind of, it's expected. And so God is able to help us to begin to peel back the layers. And it probably looks different in each person in this room's uh, in your life uh, because we peel back the layers differently. Each situation is a little different in how the hurt has occurred and the pain. And I, I believe and I truly understand that God knows that. But, but Jesus gives us this process of trusting him that, that he can make all these things good and inviting us to pray for those people so that we can become forgiving people. Last night after the service, someone came up to me and they said, I I felt incredibly convicted this entire message and I I don't really know. Like, I don't know if I'm doing the right thing. And so she she opened her heart and we talked for uh, quite a while. And, And I said, it sounds like to me you are doing the right thing. 
But if you're wrestling with whether you're being forgiving or, or what forgiveness looks like in your situation, just ask Jesus. Ask him. He's the one that, that asks you to be a forgiving person, so ask him for his help. He'll, he'll talk to you. We believe that the Holy Spirit will communicate at a depth and a level to your spirit, and he'll make it clear. You don't need to feel any guilt. Just be open to what God says to you. Ask a few trusted friends. Consult scripture, and God will make it clear to you. I think this is a deeply personal thing for each one of us. And, and what it looks like to begin to peel the layers back may look different for each one of us. But we can just go to Jesus and say, Jesus, I want to honor you. I want to be that forgiving person. So help me. Help me to know how to do that. Let's pray together today. Father, we are grateful. We are grateful that you sent your son to help us, to help us learn what it's like to live in a relationship with you, to help us see what it's like to be forgiving people. But God, we need your help. We need your help to in, infuse our minds and to soften our hearts, to, to show us what this really looks like for us today, where we live, where we stand. And so God, we trust that as we leave this place in, in a little while, that you'll continue to speak to us as you have today. You'll continue to work on us and, and make it clear to us what we need to do to be forgiving people you're calling us to be. God, it's my prayer that those who are at Crossbridge this weekend would have soft and open hearts to you, that when they hear you talking to them, they'd be obedient. And God, it's my prayer that you'd give them the courage they need, the strength they need, the community they need, to begin to address the mess that maybe someone else caused in their life. God, you help us to know that as we forgive, we find healing and it increases in our life. And so God, it's my prayer, it's my hope that walking out of these doors today, some people would be committed to forgiving and finding healing in their own lives. Jesus, help us this week to be the kind of people you're calling us to be. In your name we pray, amen.